This is day four of reading Revelation. After this, I had a vision of an open door to heaven, and I heard the trumpet-like voice that had spoken to me before, saying, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen afterwards. At once I was caught up in spirit. A throne was there in heaven, and on the throne sat one whose appearance sparkled like jasper and carnelian. Around the throne was a halo as brilliant as an emerald. Surrounding the throne I saw twenty-four other thrones on which twenty-four elders sat, dressed in white garments and with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Seven flaming torches burned in front of the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. In front of the throne was something that resembled a sea of glass like crystal. In the center and around the throne there were four living creatures, covered with eyes in front and in back. The first creature resembled a lion. The second was like a calf. The third had a face like that of a human being, and the fourth looked like an angel in flight. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, were covered with eyes inside and out. Day and night they do not stop exclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before the one who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever. They throw down their crowns before the throne, exclaiming, Worthy are you, Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. Because of your will they came to be and were created. I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sits, sits on the throne. It had writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a mighty angel who proclaimed in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to examine it. I shed many tears because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to examine it. One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, has triumphed, enabling him to open the scroll with its seven seals. Then I saw standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and the elders a lamb that seemed to have been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes. These are the seven spirits of God sent out into the whole world. He came and received the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. When he took it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each of the elders held a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the holy ones. They sang a new hymn, Worthy are you to receive the scroll and to break open its seals, for you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God those from every tribe and tongue, people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests for our God, and they will reign on earth. In this passage, we have a vision of the glory of the throne room of God. There's incredible opulence, the way it is described as being made of precious stones and semi-precious stones and gold and crystal, everything shiny and seemingly very perfect. This is certainly a drastic contrast with ordinary life at the time and indeed with ordinary life now. Most of us don't have floors and walls made of gold. There's also a commentary being made here about the contrast with worldly power and wealth, because these are in some ways the things that people who were reading this would have expected worldly rulers to have, and yet here they're being put in a very different context. They're not being used in a way that oppresses. They're not being used in a way that is exclusive. Somehow the glory of God shines on everyone who is in the scene, indeed shines on the writer, shines on us, even at this distance. So there's something about power and the riches that come with wealth that is being reassigned here, given a different and perhaps uh, more spiritual and more desirable meaning 
from what people at the time would have thought worldly rulers were doing with all the wealth that they had. There's been much speculation about who the 24 elders are in this scene. And one theory is that it's the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 main followers of Jesus, but we really don't know. In a way, it doesn't really matter. All that the author is saying is that there are those who have great glory in heaven as a reflection of their lives on this earth, whether lives of suffering, lives of service, lives of witness. Uh, and so they occupy places of honor around the throne. And yet what they do is they routinely fall down in worship. It doesn't seem as if they are lording it over anyone else. Most of what they do seems to be directed away from themselves and toward God. The same is true of the four living creatures. Those who have sharp eyes will recognize that they are described in ways that sound a lot like the way we describe the, the traditional symbols for the four Gospels. That may well be where those uh, symbols originate. And there are plenty of other meanings of four in the Bible. So four is one of those numbers that comes up again and again. What they cry out, holy, 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 is an echo of Isaiah's vision of the throne room of God when he is describing how it was that he was called to be a prophet. So there's something in this about a prophet being commissioned. Perhaps something is being said to the author of Revelation about the role of this book as being prophetic, speaking about current conditions and speaking about the imperfections of this world that God judges. You'll note also that there are multiple sevens. Again, seven, you'll recall, implies completeness or fullness, perfection of a sort. And so the multiple sevens are just to drive the point home again and again that in the presence of God, nothing is lacking. There is completeness. There is fullness of everything, fullness of joy, as it says elsewhere in the gospel. The lamb should be interpreted to be Jesus, and the scroll almost certainly to be the plan of God, however we interpret that, whether it is the plan of God in time or the plan of God in relations between God and humanity, the way humanity relates to itself. We don't know, but there is something in it that is important that the writer is being told will play a part in how events unfold and how it is that God moves toward the perfecting of creation uh, that is ultimately the, the, the end of everything. It's interesting that in this there is a vision of worship. You may know that in the Eastern Orthodox Church they understand the Divine Liturgy, which is their version of the Eucharist, what they do on Sunday morning, to be a model of what heaven is like. Some of it comes perhaps from this, from images of what worship would be like in the very presence of God. We believe that we are always in the presence of God, that God is among us. Here, it's a, it takes on a much more literal form. They're in the throne room of God before the majesty of God. There is no mediation. There is no veil between them. We see what worship is like. Worship is about directing attention away from oneself and toward God, offering reverence to God, and remembering one's own place in the, uh, the divine plan. So there's, as I say, there's completion and there's fullness in this. Nothing is lacking. And I think it's probably not too much of a stretch to imagine that this is intended to be a little bit of what lately I've been referring to as the trail mix before we head into Lent. It is intended to be a vision of glory before troubling events begin to happen so that we know that the glory of God is always behind all of this. The, the perfection and serenity of God is, is in no way questioned by anything that happens after this in the visions of the writer. So we take this moment to survey the majesty of God before uh, the more difficult parts of the book begin to unfold. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh.